Good morning, everybody. How you guys doing? Hello, hello. So I'm Jason. I'm one of the pastors here at CFC. It's an honor to be in, standing in front of you. It's something I don't take lightly, and um, I'm really excited to jump into uh, the next part of, of First Peter. Uh, before I do, a story. Uh, so the, the U.S. Navy, they have this magazine called Proceedings, and it's like the, the, most, the longest uh, continuously published magazine, I think, in the United States since like the late 1800s. And so they have this like, classic story from, um, from this. Uh, two battleships are out uh, on training maneuvers, and, and they're, it's kind of like less than optimal weather. Uh, a little bit stormy, foggy. It's, it's going down. It's a couple of days you know, into the, these uh, training maneuvers. The captain decides, I'm going to stay up on one of the captains, stay up on the bridge, and I just want to keep my eyes on what's happening. So the sun's going down, and... Uh, one of the uh, lookouts says to the captain, hey, uh, captain, um, there's a light, uh, there's a light on our starboard bow. And so the captain said, well, is it, is it a steady light or is it moving, um, is it moving uh, away from us? He said, it's, it's steady, which means they're on a, like a collision course. And so the, so the captain says uh, to the signalman, this is back when you would uh, signal with lights, right, before radio. So he says to the signalman, um, what I want you to do, signal to that, to that light, uh, we had a collision course, we advise you to move 20 degrees. So um, the signalman does that, and he gets a message back from the other signalman, uh, we advise you to move 20 degrees, right? You see what's, what's happening here. Okay. So the captain says, another message, you tell him, this is the captain of the ship that's speaking, I'm the captain, you move 20 degrees. So sends a signal. And the message back comes back, I am a seaman second class, um, and I advise you to move 20 degrees. And so you can imagine the captain is heated. He is livid. And he says, you send back, I am a battleship. That's it. You move 20 degrees. And uh, the message back was, uh, I am a lighthouse. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we live in these, like, really dark and, and stormy times, all sorts of voices are like shouting orders at us, right? And uh, it, it's like into the night. They're telling us what to do, how to adjust our lives. Teachers, uh, politicians, YouTubers, advertisers are all just kind of saying, hey, this is, they're trying to, even, even pastors are trying to like set us straight, right? And uh, it doesn't matter what you watch. Uh, it could be Fox, CNN, MSNBC, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, like they're all giving us news and views and, and advice. It's a lot swirling about. And um, it's easy to lose your bearings. It's easy to really, it's re really easy to feel lost in, in the midst of that. And I just feel like we need, to be, we need to be paying attention to the right voice, to the correct voice. It is a holy voice. And we need to be paying attention to that voice even when it feels like it's a little strange, um, even when it feels like it's it maybe even a little absurd from, from time to time, when it doesn't make sense. So now we spent the past uh, several weeks uh, listening to Peter's voice as he's e encouraging and exhorting the church, right? And they're in a really dark and stormy time. It's, a, it's, it's some hard persecution happening right now. And so what Peter has been doing in the first half of the book is he's been using a beautiful, this beautiful Old Testament imagery to help the church get their minds right, right? So he's, been, he's told them, you are a new type of family, right? And, and, and you're the holy people of God. You're, you're journeying through this wilderness of suffering. And you are the, the people of the new exodus, and, and you've been redeemed by Jesus who is the ultimate Passover lamb. You are members of the new covenant and God's word is like embedded inside you. And you are a new temple. You are built on the living stone of Jesus Christ. And not only the new temple, you are also a new kingdom of priests. And you are right there as God's representatives to the nations, your mediators. And so do you see what he's doing? Like he's using all these beautiful images and metaphors to help place their suffering in the context of a larger, the larger story of God. He's connecting them, right, to the, to the story that's been, that's been happening for generations and generations. And now, so now here we are in part two 
um, and which structurally is like part two of the letter, and it becomes a lot more practical. And, and basically, um, he's telling them, here, here's how you're going to live your, here's some advice on how to live a holy life, and how to, really, how to, uh, how to make, how to make good decisions, how to trust God in real life circumstances when things aren't going very well. And so specifically in this part, in this next part, he's going to start talking about submission. One of our favorite words, right? Anybody love, yeah, I love that word. That's almost like the F word, depending on where you are and what the context. Um, so the big idea today is this. I'm going to read, I want to define this word. Submission is obeying the correct voice. It's, it's listening to the correct voice. And, and, it's, and it's, it's challenging, Submission is not just challenge, it's, it's surprising, and it helps us to access the will of God. If we, can, if we can get the submission thing right, I think really God will not steer us in the wrong direction if we're listening to his voice, as, as strange as it may sound. So here we are, in the second half of the letter, Peter kicks it off, and he's going to, if you look, if you read ahead, like he's talking a lot to women and, and to slaves. Um, and because I preached on the household codes uh, earlier this year when we were in Colossians 3, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in the weeds of the social relationships because we've talked about this recently, uh, about what was kind of happening in those times. Instead, uh, I want to point out just, just a couple of things um, as you think about this. So, one, it's okay uh, when he's talking about submission and he's, in, these, in these concepts. It's okay if, it, if, it, if these passages can make you feel uncomfortable, uh, right? It, that, that's all right because I think they do. They kind of trigger us a, a little bit. They trigger the modern mind um, because, uh, like, when you look at, like, we're all familiar with disordered relationships, messy marriages, like racial tension, political tension. Like, we're living it, right? And so, and so when you see this, it's almost like a, a reminder. But, but I want to just urge you that we should not be ignoring or dismissing, like, these pieces of Scripture um, outright. Instead, we need to kind of lean in and begin to ask deeper questions, uh, more complex questions to trying to figure out the why. So remember, our minds are shaped by our current reality. So you don't have a first century mind. You have a 21st century mind. Me too. And so when we're looking at an ancient passage of Scripture, you have to look at, you have to begin to think, how was that original audience situated, right? Don't just assume they thought and saw the world as you did. They didn't. Uh, no, no, no. Like, when you're, and, and, and just think about this, when you're reading a new, this, really reading a, a letter here, that you're reading out of somebody's inbox, right? And so there's a lot of stuff that's, that's missing. You need a lot of context pieces you need to be searching out and uh, to, to kind of put together. So uh, some questions you can ask yourself was, hey, what, what, were I, what was normal at, at this time? Uh, what would have been assumed in their world? Um, what was the cultural tensions at that time? What, how would those people have received the letter? Well, in the case of, of Peter's letter, I, I would say this. There's a phenomenon that was happening in Roman households at that time. You know what it was? Uh, so slaves and women were becoming Christians much faster than the men were, right? At a faster rate. And so you had all these households with uh, slaves and women that are, that are following Jesus, but the patriarch, the head of the house, wasn't. Now, here's the tension, that in these Roman households, they were expected to worship the household gods of that patriarch. So like, oh, what do, what do we do here? And so what, what, what Peter is saying to them is, no, 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 you're free. Here's what I mean by you're free. You're free. You're, there's no obligation for you to worship those household gods. You worship Jesus alone. I want you to be free to love your household. And free, you're free, so you're, you're free to, to not rebel, right? To love the household that you're in and to not rebel. And notice that, I think what, what's happening here is Peter is like talking directly to the women and the slaves. Did you see that? Like he's, he's not just going to be, he's not just talking about them to other people. He's talking to them directly. So which is a nod to their value in the kingdom of God. And it's a nod to their agency in the church. Like he had a really high view of, of women and, and slaves. So it's a, a beautiful thing to remember. So We'll leave that there kind of as a context on the side. So Peter's telling these folks that who have been transformed by the saving grace of Jesus. He's saying, you guys need to live, we need to live a radical life. We need to live a radical life in a very, very messy culture. And so um, let's dive into uh, the, the passage here. So starting with verse 11, here we go. 
Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may say your good, see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. So if you kind of go back, let's go back to the beginning of that passage. First Peter tells them again that they are, you see that on the first line, they're foreigners and, and exiles, right? And so that he's doing that again. So it's another image. He's connecting them to the greater story of God, um, that, they are, that they are temporary residents in this broken world, and their true homeland is the kingdom of God. It's not in the suffering that they're in right now. And man, that sounds great, doesn't it? But frankly, it's a tough concept for us to live out on a day-to-day basis. It's hard for, for me. Like, I think it's really, it's just challenging to embrace. I think at, at best, I feel like I've got one foot here in the world and one foot here, like, in the kingdom of God. I feel like I'm straddling those realities. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah, okay. So, and, and in straddling, it's like we have, our, our behavior kind of reflects that, I think, too. So sometimes it's like, sometimes I'm, like, holding up the Bible you know, my behavior shows that, like, I hear and I, I, I believe the word of God, and sometimes I'm just holding up a big framing hammer, right? And this is, like, symbolic of, I'm going to do things my way. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I got this. And so this is kind of, like, representative of the, of the world. Um, I'm going to work my own way to success. I'm going to construct my own kingdom. And, and at times, these can be in tension with one another. Um, we sense the tension between like, what God wants for us and what we think we need. And so Peter's elevating Christian ethics here. He's like, he's like, he's like abstain from sinful desires. And I, I think we, as if, if you've been in a church for some time, you're like, yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Like, we love that idea. We want to be in environments like that. We want to be in spaces that are like that. Uh, so, you know, Peter's like preaching at them, you know, abstain from sin- sinful desires. Yeah! Tell them, Peter. And, and we want you to wage, because they're going to wage war against your souls. Preach. And, and, and if, you, if you do things right, the haters are going to become Christians. All right. That's what I like. So, so we love that idea, right? Because that's, I mean, that's a really cool story. That's a really cool possibility. But, although we love that idea, like I think putting it into practice, man, we have trouble with that sometimes right? Consistently. If we're being honest, like what, what Peter says here does not resonate when things are going tough. When the heat is turned up, when we're feeling the stress, like we forget that. And we don't want to listen to that voice. Because um, that word submit, the world says, hey, you want to you know what? Submit. You don't submit. You fight for what you believe in. That's what the world says. You fight. Revolt. <laughs> um, the Bible says violent resistance is counter to the Jesus ethic, right? To love your enemies. And then the world says, like, silence ignorant talk. I'll tell you how to silence ignorant talk. Punch to the face. <laughs> you silence ignorant talk with a nasty tweet. Um, and, and, and God is saying, no, 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 we allow our actions to speak for themselves, our Christ-like actions to speak for themselves, that God is the just judge. Um, the world defines freedom as what? Freedom to uh, speak your truth, freedom to live in any way that makes you feel good, freedom to advertise your individuality, and the Bible's like, it's like redefining freedom as freedom from guilt and shame. 
freedom from the power of sin, freedom from the obligation to think that you can even earn God's love. Freedom to be known in a new community, an authentic community with other people who can love you as a fellowship. That's freedom. So, so again, big idea, submission is obeying the correct voice. So what is that voice saying? Well, if we, let's, let's zoom in to verse 17. I think there's a, there's a key here that we need to be paying attention to. He says, show proper respect to everyone, love the family of believers, fear God, honor the emperor. Okay, so there are four audiences and there are four verbs, that, four commands that are used there. I put the nerdy Greek in there not to show off, but the Greek is in there just so you can see that the first and the last are the same verb, the same command. And in some of our modern English translations, they actually flip it up. So, but it's, the, the word is tameo, to honor, which means to assign value to, to respect. And then you have these other words, phobeo is fear, and uh, agapao is to love. So there's, these actually have different connotations as well. So different weights to them. So the heaviest weight is fear, right? That fear. So that's kind of at the top. And then the next heaviest word is what? It's, it's the love word. And then below that is, is honor. So you can reorder this. I call this Peter's pyramid of priorities. So boom, right there. So if you look at the, the top part, fear God, love the believers, and then you have honor all people, honor the emperor, right? So that gives us kind of a prioritized list of who we should be listening to. Number one voice is God. Number two voice is other believers. Number three voice is everybody else. Um, so, hey, do you know what he's doing here? This is kind of cool. As an aside, Peter's being a little bit subversive. Can you see it? Because he's putting the emperor on the same line as all the other uh, people, right? The emperor thought he was like a deity. And so, you know, that, that's something, again, like it's kind of good for us to know in, the, in that context. He's getting a little jab, a little jab to the emperor. But he's doing it. He's like, we're still going to honor the emperor. Now, you might feel, you might, it's, it's, I think this kind of, Begs a question for us, especially as November approaches. Um, so how do you do that? How do, how do you honor the emperor? I, I think it's worth mentioning. You can honor the emperor or the president or the governor or the whatever um, and disagree with them at the same time. Do you believe that? Yeah, some, some kind of some of the, I'm getting a little bit of the, <laughs> little bobbleheads. <laughs> uh, now, I'm not going to launch any political grenades or hopefully not step on any landmines, but I will say this, that um, if you feel like there's a, a type of righteousness that allows you to demonize and trash any public figure, you're actually working against your witness. You're not helping anybody. It might make you feel good, but it's, you're not doing any, it's not any value to the kingdom of God to rip somebody apart. Um, that, that really, we can, we can have very strong convictions and at the same time exemplify the character of Christ. We can do both at the same time. We can... We can nuance that, and I think we're required to as followers of, of Christ. So how do we honor a political figure that we disagree with? Uh, practical. Uh, what's a step? So I, so I got this friend. I was allowed to share the story. Friend, a buddy of mine named John, who's very politically active, and um, he gets triggered when he sees yard signs that he disagrees with, right? And he's like, man, I just want to take a hammer, and I want to, you know, it's like he just wants to start ripping signs out of yards. That's, that's part of him. That's the tension, right, in the world. And then, and then he also knows, he's like, but that's not what God wants for me. And so he, he said, he's got this great idea. He says, when I see, I try, when I see political signs, I use them as cue cards to begin to pray for the names of those people and to be asking God, God, will you raise up, will you raise up more righteous leaders in the land? And, and, just, and, and, and God, we trust you. We will not fear. We trust you. So it's like this exercise as he drives and prays. But there's a real tension that he's, he's kind of he's working through. So um, the problem is this. If you take that pyramid and you turn it upside down, that's when you start getting into trouble, when you invert the pyramid. When you put the, mo the least important voices at the top 
or, or you begin to fear the emperor and fear the world and fear the sight. Like, that's not what we're supposed to be doing. We've got to have a, well, a, a correctly ordered pyramid. Um, submission is obeying the correct voice. So I have this good friend, Brett, um, and a couple of you maybe have heard this story. Um, I think Brett understood the submission thing and how to hear the right voice, how to hear the correct voice. Uh, when we were in our 20s, he got diagnosed with a brain tumor, um, and so I was with him from diagnosis to death. And uh, it was really interesting to see how he wrestled with God and then also how he kind of submitted himself to God and said, hey, whatever. It was, a really, it was really powerful. And I, I, I struggled with the goodness of God and that suffering at the same time. Um, so at his funeral, there was a pretty interesting thing happened. Um, a teacher and a, and a nurse stood up. This is after kind of I delivered the eulogy. A teacher and a nurse stood up, passing the mic around. They're sharing stories. So neither of them knew Brett before he had cancer. They'd only known him since the diagnosis. And so they were seeing him from the hardest, the, the biggest storm in his life. And they, they said, like, man, there was something otherworldly about this guy. Like, he had, like, this peace and this joy, and it drew them in, right? And they began to ask him questions about, like, what is the hope that you have within you? Like, why aren't you just, like, so frustrated and so angry right now at this diagnosis? Like, you're going to die soon. And, uh, and so he would share the gospel with them. And you know what happened is... Um, like, they became followers of Jesus because of his testimony. And, and so here you have, so Brett dies, Brett suffers and dies, but at his funeral, we see that, that new life is springing from his death. And, and that's the surprise of submission, that new life can kind of spring from tragedy and suffering. I mean, that's what happened with Jesus and his obedience. If we look at 1 Peter 1, 23, when they hurled insults at him, he didn't retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who just judges justly. And then you go back, jump down a little bit. He, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. So I want you to just kind of picture the posture of Jesus, open-handed, outstretched arms, cross-shaped. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's kind of the, the summary of Jesus' posture. And then what happens? Mark 15 captures this incredible moment when Jesus breathes his last breath. You know who was there at the foot of the cross? There was this centurion, right? Right? And, and here's what Mark tells us. He stood there in front of Jesus and saw how he died. And he said, surely this man was the son of God. Surprise! A violent soldier who committed unspeakable acts of torture is now declaring that, that Jesus is the son of God. That is, nobody saw that coming. So, so like, wow. At that moment, there's like an earthquake. The sky grows dark, right? It's a crazy thing. Crazy stuff is happening right at Jesus' death. And yet, even in, in that darkness, in that difficulty, it's like this light is shining down from heaven into the darkness of this man's soul. And he has this aha experience. Even at the moment of Jesus' own death, He's transforming people around him. Wow. So that's the heart of the gospel that we are invited into, friends. Like, to allow that light of God to break through our darkness so that we can regenerate new life. New life can be regenerated in us. Like, because of Jesus' death and resurrection, like, the big wound has been healed. The price has been paid. And so we have this ability to now be in a restored relationship with God. Oh my gosh. Nothing stands in, in the way. And so that's a big surprise. Surprise number two. I think surprise number two is 
from this idea is like, we're still here. That's a little bit of a surprise. Uh, that the church is still alive some 2,000 years later. That it lasted beyond a generation or two is kind of nuts when you think about it. Uh, he only had like about a dozen that followed him closely. At the resurrection, there were 500. And even some of those fools doubted. Right? Of the 500 that saw him. They doubted like, I don't know about that. And so, not only that, but right at that moment, like the, after the resurrection, the, the persecution knob was turned to 11, and really the religious authorities at that time, they wanted to stomp out the remnant. They're like, all right, we're done with this whole Jesus disruption. And so they start going crazy, and um, so the disciples are forced to flee. And a lot of them have to leave their home base in, in Jerusalem. They're hiding, um, but they're sharing stories along the way so how how did it survive like how did they was there just like some like holy spirit force field around them that was just protecting them you know like a big dome no like, like that's not how it happened i think i think and maybe this is another surprise in and of itself is that that these this ragtag group of followers started to hear the voice they started to listen to the voice the correct voice and and so what they did was they uh they spent a lot of their time man like Hiding and preaching and praying. This is the book of Acts, the early chapters. They're preaching and praying and hiding and waiting to see what the Lord's going to do. And there's one, one part in Acts chapter 4, right, where they're all, you know, they're together, like praying, and there's like a little mini earthquake. And then they're, they're, it says that they were all kind of filled with the Holy Spirit and began to, to preach the word of God boldly. It's beautiful. So they're hearing the voice, and things are happening around them. God is showing up in a big way. Even though it's hard, even though there's suffering, even though there's persecution, even though friends are dying around them, it's, it's still happening. Out, even as folks like Stephen are being martyred, you have outsiders that are, that are being welcomed in, that new people are repenting of their sins, that this small little fledgling movement is now growing and blossoming. Um, and we're still here today. Uh, one of the chief persecutors was Saul, right? You guys know this story. And uh, he has an encounter with Jesus. He becomes a follower himself. Fast forward for a couple months. He's arrested. He's stripped. He's beaten. He's flogged. He's thrown into jail. Acts chapter 16. Uh, what happens? He's all chained up in jail. And uh, there's an earthquake. And then the chains fall from his wrists. The, it says that the prison doors were flung open. But Paul was already free inside. And so what does he do? Well, he hears this voice. And the voice said, let's hang out for a little bit. And so the jailer, he's about to kill himself out of shame. So better I do it than somebody else. And Paul says, whoa, we're still here. And so because of that obedience and listening to the voice, well, I would have, I would have been gone, Right? I'd have been like, that's a sign from heaven. I'm out. But, but Paul doesn't do that. He's just, he's so tuned in. He listens to this absurd voice that's like, hang out. And then what happens? He leads many, this, this, this jailer and his entire family, to faith in Jesus Christ. Amazing. So when he submits, like new life is kind of like springing from it. Can you see a pattern here? That, like, obeying the right voice opens the door for human flourishing. Even if it's hard, it opens the door for human flourishing. So, CFC, we're invited into the same story. We're invited into the same story. So, <clears throat> let me ask you this. How many of you have been yelling at the lighthouse this week? You're like, God, I advise you to turn 20 degrees into my direction. You know, like, I, I have been. I think we have those moments where we feel like we're screaming at the lighthouse and we, do, we want God to just kind of bend to our will. We need to know how to better hear that voice, I think. And so the three things, I just want to share with you kind of three things in closing that I'm working on um, that maybe will help you as well. One, to check your pyramid. Two, to expect to wrestle. Three, to slow down and ask for the resources. So one, check your pyramid. So I just kind of redid that. So who are you listening to? 
Who are your most influential voices? We got it right there. Is it God, Christians, everybody else? Or do you have it flipped upside down? Who is it that you're, what is it that you're consuming and, and taking in? Is it all the third row stuff? Everybody else? There's a lot that fits in that bottom category. Um, you know, what if you could read a transcript of everything that you said and thought and did at the end of each day? Wouldn't that be horrifying? You're sitting in bed at night, you're just kind of going through like, oh man, I said that, oh, I thought that. Man, I'm glad that that technology does not exist yet. I hope it doesn't until I'm gone. <laughs> so, like we would, but it would tell you a lot about who your biggest influencers are, what you're parroting, um, who are you listening to. If you want like a little self-awareness exercise, something you could do, is maybe a little dangerous, is you could just ask somebody close to you, who do you think are my top three voices right now? How's my pyramid shaped? Do I have it upside down? What do you think? Is it crooked? Um, so check your pyramid. Ask God to reveal to you some wisdom in that area, like particularly like what do I need to stop doing, what do I need to start doing. Second is ex expect to wrestle. So <clears throat> following God's voice is not easy. It's definitely not easy. Um, and especially because he, he takes you places often that you don't want to go, that you resist. He doesn't do it because he's mean or nasty or spiteful. I think he does that because we are shaped by the difficulty. We can be shaped through the suffering. I mean, Jesus himself is. We find him in the Garden of Gethsemane, broken, sorrowful, right? And uh, he says in Matthew 26, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And then three times, he goes and prays the same prayer. Father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. This cup meaning this trial, this difficulty. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And, and you know what? The answer was nope. I'm kind of, I mean, that doesn't make sense. But like, I'm glad it was no, right? Because now I can be a new creation. I can have a flourishing life as a follower of Jesus. So here's what we need to, focus in on, that Jesus' prayer there, that his suffering was not theater. It was preparation. It was, those prayers were helping him to get his will calibrated with God's will. And so I think the same is true for us, right? If we embrace the wrestling as an opportunity, like the suffering, it, it helps us to burn away false expectations, to burn away false hopes and distractions, and helps us to get, get our will calibrated with God's will. Um, this is not something that can be done overnight, for sure. It's not an easy step. It's a path. It's a journey. So third, slow down and ask for the resources. And I think one of the greatest resources that we're given is access to the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God that is inside of us. Um, you know, like... Jesus breathes out the Holy Spirit on the disciples in John chapter 20. And he says, like, receive the Holy Spirit. And then, and then, really, the Holy Spirit has been made available to everybody that confesses Jesus Christ as Lord. And it's like the Spirit is given to them as they're sent. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And then when I feel like, man, I need to take things in my own hands and pick up the hammer, it's like the Spirit can, like, check us. No, 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 no. There's another way. There's another path. Um, I think the Spirit can remind us <laughs> when our pyramids are messed up. I think uh, the Spirit can give us this reservoir of peace when like all hell is breaking loose around you in the chaos. So last night after the Saturday night service, I had a uh, a young CFCer came up to me, he's in his 20s, and he said, hey, that story about the cancer really resonated with me, because that's me. I've got cancer, I've got five to 10 years, and, uh, and I was like, oh. And he goes, I I'm actually, I'm doing okay. He goes, I, his advice was not about like, where do I find God in this? That's what I was expecting. It was like, 
how do I help my friends and family get to where I'm at right now? And, and so I said, man, that's, that is quite the journey. And I said, just keep telling the stories of how God is meeting you in your suffering. The Holy Spirit gives us this reservoir of peace. When you and I can sense the closeness of God, do you know what I mean? Like when you can sense that closeness, like it's a whole lot easier to entrust your life to him. When you can feel like in the storm, like, okay, there's a light, like I... It's, it's much easier for us to say, okay. So I want to lead us through a, a, a prayer really quickly. Well, not really quick. I'm, it's going to be like a, a half speed of the Lord's Prayer. So we've got it up here on the screen. Um, and I want you to, to use it as just kind of a, as a tool to help us kind of refocus. Maybe the Spirit will speak to you about um, where you're at and what needs to, what needs to happen next. So you ready to pray with me? Okay. This is from Matthew chapter 6. And Jesus teaching his disciples how to pray. So our Father in heaven, hallowed, holy is your name. May your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. God, following your voice is not easy because you do take us places we don't want to go. Help us to know, help us to really embrace the fact that you're shaping us through difficult times. Help us to lean into the trials. We're thankful that you've given us new life, that we are a new creation, that we are members of your kingdom, we are exiles. We want to flourish as these new creations and invite other people into this wonderful life. Pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us. You would help us to calm our minds, to still ourselves, and to put in new, new habits into practice so that we can put your voice above all the others. In Jesus' name, amen.